Welcome back. Now, real Dr. Nyla Wolf here with Wolf Coaching, and today we're reacting to Ryan Humiston and his takes on range of motion. As you may or may not know, my PhD was actually exactly on range of motion. So it always warms my heart a little bit when I see influencers talking about range of motion. Today, let's see whether these takes warm my heart or break my heart. Ever since I was a little girl, I've been searching for the most efficient way to build muscle because we all know it's a slow- Efficient muscle growth is good. Process. I mean, you could do what I've always done, which is just wear small- So I'm not sure about Ryan Humiston, but I think he might be on steroids, right? Like I'm not gonna say it for sure, but I think he might be on PDs. Not saying anything about his credibility or anything else, but if he's on steroids, I think that gives him a different rate of progress compared to us mere mortals that are not enhanced. So. Just something to note. Smaller and smaller shirts, but that too has its drawbacks. People stare at your dick. Here's what we know so far. Hypertrophy is a direct result of either mechanical tension, metabolic stress, or muscle damage. Another thing- He gets points for understanding the three mechanisms that have been hypothesized. Recruitment, whether using light or heavy weight. That's true as well. You can use lighter or heavier weights for hypertrophy. Also, the method you use to stimulate the muscle does not matter whether you use free weights or machines and cables. That's true too, he's killing it. He's hitting it all right now, bam. Citing research. One thing there's not a consensus on is if we should train a muscle always at length. And if the answer is yes, then should we modify- He's looking jacked right now. Parts of that are actually at longer length. It's confusing, let's get into it. To help shed some- light, Nice barbecue to look at some recent case studies. In a 2021 case study, they took a bunch of untrained adults. All right, pause. These are not case studies. These are randomized controlled trials. Case studies are where you take one person and you watch them do their thing, right? That could be, for example, a bodybuilder who's competing for, preparing for a show. You could watch how his hormones change over the course of his preparation. That would be a case study where you don't really change anything, you simply observe. These are randomized controlled trials, which are actually one of the more valid pieces of evidence. Basically, you have randomized controlled trials, and then you have meta-analyses or systematic reviews that take all of those randomized controlled trials and summarize them. But let's not pretend what he's talking about here is a case study, because it's really not. I think we have a skit on our hands here. And compared them doing a lying leg curl versus a seated leg curl. After 12 weeks, the seated hamstring curl was the clear winner. It showed significant increases in hypertrophy. The classic myo study. Muscles. If you look at the total volume of the muscles, the seated hamstring curls caused them to increase by 14.1%. Compare that to the lying leg curls, which was 9.3%, which I know doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a one and a half fold increase. Imagine if you just read. So there's a couple issues with what he's doing here. Number one, he's just looking at the percentage increase in both groups. That's something we call magnitude-based inferences in statistics. It's not ideal, let's just put it that way. The second thing is he's not even measuring or mentioning rather variance, or basically how much of a difference was there between participants in these studies. Because if we see that there's a 50% difference, but there's a huge spread in how participants responded, you could just say, well, yeah, sure, there's a difference, but it could just be because the results are all over the fucking place, right? So a couple of issues with how he's presenting it, but I get it's supposed to be brief, snappy, YouTube shit, am I right? Comment, like, subscribe. Just reach down, grab your balls, and one of them was one and a half times bigger? That's, that's a problem. If you're wondering why I'm sweating so I agree with this. It's 50% of growth difference is absolutely notable. But when you dig a little deeper, you realize, holy hell, this is a lot more impactful than I thought it was because that was just looking at the percentage change across all three muscles. When you look at the individual muscles, you see that the semi-tendinosis and semi-membro... Memor... Semi-membranosis. Semi yeah, it's a hard word. ...smaller, but still significant increases. But the real change came from the girthier and larger muscle, the biceps femoris. Indeed. The percentage change was 14.4... Well, rather, it was the bicep femoris long head. The short head saw about the same growth, and that makes sense because the short head of the hamstrings here doesn't actually insert the hip. And so whether you're doing seated or lying leg curls, it'll get the same growth. But yeah, the long head doesn't insert the hip. So when you're seated, it's more lengthened, which is more growth producing. 2.2 fold increase. I don't even need the ball example to explain to you why that's such a big deal. If you pulled your pants down and your ball was 2.2 times bigger, you might even have that's a facts. adorable sling. Now this study is not without its limitations. It was done on untrained people. And normally that's a huge negative for me, but 
This study was so well designed that I think we can still apply it to our own training because they didn't. So here's an issue with just blanket ignoring untrained studies. Mechanisms and muscle physiology are broadly the same between more trained participants and more untrained participants. In fact, I'd go so far as to say, unless you have a really solid difference as to why you'd expect trained lifters to be different from untrained lifters in this regard, you shouldn't just be throwing out the untrained studies altogether. There's a lot of solid reasons from a research perspective to include untrained subjects. For one, they're usually easier to recruit. You try getting committed bodybuilders into the lab to stop training in the gym and to just train in the lab twice a week for three sets each. It's just not gonna happen. You also see bigger improvements in muscle size and strength in untrained lifters. And so if you're trying to measure differences, if you don't see a benefit from pre to post because someone's been training for 10 years, it's gonna get kind of hard to see whether there's differences between say a partial range of motion or a full range of motion. So trained lifters can be really helpful in this regard. If you're ignoring studies on account of simply there being some untrained subjects, please don't. They didn't just split the population into two and had one group do lying and one do seated and compare the results. They had them dedicate a leg. Indeed, so within participants. Very good. That way there was no genetic differences and they would compare the results of the individual. They also randomize which... So it's not just genetic differences. He has a good point here. It's also nutritional differences. It's also differences in sleep. It's also differences in stress. It's a lot of different things. By using within participant design, you usually sacrifice some ecological validity, right? Like no one really trains one hamstring one way and the other hamstring a different way, right? They usually do, they might do single leg training, but it'll be the same exercise, same range of motion, etc. So it's a little bit less valid in terms of how you train in the real world. However, it equalizes, it removes a lot of variance. And so it makes for a really solid study, right? You either need fewer people to come to the same robustness of conclusion, or you can get the same people and have much more robust conclusions about is there a difference between the seated leg curl and the lying leg curl? Which leg was gonna be chosen for each exercise? That way somebody's dominant leg wouldn't be factored into the results. And these results are attributed to the fact that the hamstring muscles are more at length during the seated leg curl, which makes sense the more you think about it because when you get done doing a lying leg curl, you can just lay there and take a nap. When you're done with the seated, you wanna get out of there as quick as you possibly can. So given the- Good visuals. Now as fascinating as that was, so I think, I'm not sure if he's going to go into detail here. He missed out a lot of results here. Specifically, he only talked about three muscles, semitendinosus, semimembranosus, and the biceps femoris long head. He didn't mention that for the short head, as I mentioned earlier, there were no differences in growth. And this makes sense. It doesn't insert the hip, so it shouldn't be impacted by a seated or lying leg curl. He also didn't mention the gracilis and the sartorius muscle. Both of these muscles, just like the hamstrings, flex the knee. So they get trained during a leg curl. However, Unlike the hamstrings, they are hip flexors, not extensors. And so, as a result, when your hips are extended, like during a lying leg curl, they're more lengthened than when they're flexed, like during a seated leg curl. And so, by the same principle as why we saw the hamstrings, minus the short head, get greater growth in the seated leg curl, we would expect greater growth from the lying leg curl, in the sartorius and gracilis, on account of being trained at longer muscle lengths. And indeed, that's exactly what they saw. And so this study really provides a comprehensive, strong support for longer muscle length training being better for hypertrophy. But it appears you missed that, so I just thought I'd give you some context as perhaps the world number one expert on range of motion? I don't know. is isn't something I'm definitely gonna utilize in my training going forward. That had to do with hamstrings. Nobody really gets excited about hamstrings. What we do get excited about, triceps. In this oh, he's case, gonna mention the Mayo study or Stasinaki? I think it's Stasinaki study. Now neutral just means that their shoulder was at zero degrees. They also made sure that their elbow was at 90 degrees and then went down to zero. So Indeed. Just a very structured range of motion. With the other arm, they had him do an overhead cable extension where the shoulder was at 180 degrees this time. And again, elbow went from 90 to zero. That didn't feel great. So really the only difference is the shoulder is putting those triceps. What's worth noting here, by the way, is that in the pushdown condition, they weren't getting a full stretch. They also weren't getting a full stretch in the overhead extension condition. They weren't really fully letting the elbow flex in either one of those conditions. So we are comparing different muscle lengths for the long head, but for the lateral and medial head of the triceps, they don't insert the shoulder. So whether your arm is by your side or overhead doesn't impact its length. The long head is more lengthened during an overhead extension versus a pushdown. Tricep muscles at length. And you could try this at home. I'm sure you're sitting there watching this while you take a shit. Just put your elbow to your ear and you'll feel the stretch. It's true. Too. So how much of a difference does that make? 
You stink, you motherfucker. Actually a lot. The overhead version increased the long head by 28. Okay, this is the Mayo study, it seems. Yep, Mayo study. Again, that's a one and a half fold increase. That's a lot. But again, use variance if you can, but... So again, it's in more of a lengthened position as you can track through the movement, but what doesn't make it... See, the reason why effect sizes are not the same as percentage differences is because they actually take variance into account, like how differently that people improve pre to post. If you just look at percentages, you can often get the wrong idea. So don't be like Ryan here, actually look at variants as well, or effect sizes, because they actually incorporate it. Heel and lateral head increase by 1.4 as well, because they don't cross at the shoulder joint, so this shouldn't really stretch them any more or less. But what I think it is, is most people just suck at doing tricep extensions and they usually get their shoulders or their traps involved. So by increasing- the Maybe. The shoulder, uh, it just makes it so the tricep has to do the work. Doesn't matter which head, they all have to work harder and keep I think Ryan's interpretation here is plausible, but also unlikely. I've read the study front to back multiple times. I couldn't tell you why we saw better growth in the lateral and medial head in the overhead condition. It could be a variety of reasons. None of them are really that convincing. So I'm willing in the light of all the other evidence, like around 25 studies on range of motion, to chalk it up to just a false positive finding, which happens when you have a relatively smaller sample size and some degree of variance, right? But it's possible something else is at play here. I just don't know. It could be that Ryan's right. Keeps you from screwing it up. So is it that simple, case closed? Just look for ways to put a muscle at length and contract it. No. The outlier is the incline dumbbell curl because when I tested this with the EMG device- Oh boy. Here we go. Was wasting years of my life. Now there could be other reasons why you- Oh boy. Tension ...or just having that weight on stretch could cause growth, but I'm not the only- Oh boy. We're doing so well until now, Ryan. But now you just had to mention EMG and then say force instead of electrical amplitude or whatever else. EMG is not a good way to determine which exercise to do for hypertrophy. It's been called into question numerous times. It's time to stop using EMG for hypertrophy. But hey, at least until now the video was solid. I figured out this is probably not the best exercise for your long head. And in my own anecdotal experience, this is the most growth and peak I've ever seen on my biceps since I stopped doing the incline dumbbell curls and found ways to actively overstretch my short head and contract my long head, simply meaning I've- So, I think incline curls can actually be pretty solid. There has been one study comparing the incline curl in untrained women to the preacher curl and saw no major differences. Maybe differences lean slightly in favor of the preacher curl for bicep growth overall. But basically what I think you can do with the incline curl to make it a pretty decent exercise is to simply do lengthen partials. The resistance curve of the incline curl is such that there's really no tension at the bottom and the tension gets higher and higher, the lift gets harder and harder as you contract. If you do a length and partial, you can at least somewhat circumvent that issue by simply using a little bit more weight and only working in that length and position, that really good stretch for the long head. Are there better exercises out there? Yes, but the incline curl isn't the worst exercise ever and it's certainly not on the basis of EMG differences. I put my shoulder in external rotation and did weird ass curls. And the long head of the biceps is the only muscle I found where this concept just doesn't seem to work as well. But every single other muscle from calves to lats to triceps is more beneficial to train at length. So do it. Now there's something else I wanted to talk about that's very closely related to this and it has to do- To respond to this real quick, we don't have evidence of any muscle group really not responding to longer muscle length training being better for hypertrophy than shorter muscle length training. It has to do with how you fail in an exercise. You suck at failing. Most people end a set the same way. They grind out that last rep, force it to the very top, slam the weight- I know what he's gonna say here. I know what you're saying, Ryan. Hard a bunch of thick women until their next set. The flaw in assuming that your muscle has been taken to complete failure just because you can't go through a full range of motion assumes that the- What's with the self-deprecating about being fat and sweaty and stinky? This is a bit odd. It's not. They did a study where, again, they took a bunch of women. Why do they mostly get women? I'm just going to assume these oh women boy. women, so I feel more confident about the results. They set up Ryan, I know you're joking here, but there's actually a very real thing in science where women are very underrepresented in science, partly, potentially, I'm not sure about this, don't cancel me over this, partly, potentially, because they're harder to recruit, but women are very underrepresented. Just because you happen to cite two or three studies that are in women doesn't mean women are, like, the main demographic by any means. One of their arms, they did the initial range of motion. The other arm, 
the other half of the range of motion. The results? They had greater increases in cross The Pedrosa study? The Very cool. Band, closest to your elbow from the curls that were strictly in that initial range of motion. I'm almost to the point of belly button sweat. So what does that mean to you? It means that regional hypertrophy, where the muscle grows, is dependent upon the range of motion. And or the initial range of motion is when the muscle is more at the ah. mouse and active interaction and increased mechanical ah. Instead of trying to just hump up that last rep when you're unable to- So, ah, uh, man. No hate, but you can tell Ryan isn't really in this space. There's a few things here, right? Yes, you do typically see greater distal hypertrophy for the biceps, for example, that'd be closer to the elbow. Distal really just refers to the part of a muscle that's closer to its insertion site or further away from the center point of the body around the navel. Yes, with longer muscle length training, you usually see greater distal hypertrophy. However, there is likely not necessarily more actin myosin overlap at longer muscle lengths. Potentially, there is greater mechanical tension overall. As you lengthen a muscle, something called passive tension builds up. You can kind of think about it as a rubber band. When you lengthen a rubber band, it kind of like starts resisting you, right? And it wants to return to its resting length. Muscles are much the same way. They build up passive tension as you lengthen them. And so when you're training at long muscle lengths, one potential mechanism is that you're lengthening it, getting greater passive tension, and so greater overall tension, which is active tension, which is how much force you produce while lifting, plus passive tension. That's one possible explanation but it probably doesn't have to do with acting myosin. Unable to take it through a full range of motion, just cut the range down. Squeeze out a few three quarter reps, then half reps once you can't do those anymore, and then quarter reps. The idea is you're getting more time under tension and more mechanical tension, and this is how you- Ryan Hayes describing lengthened supersets, said than done on something. which is doing a full range of motion set, and when you can't get a full range of motion rep anymore, just do lengthened partials, or partial reps in that lengthened stretch position. I don't think this is the best approach. There's a few reasons for this. Number one, no studies ever actually examined this directly. So while it stands to reason it could help, who knows? Number two, most studies have directly looked at length and partials as a tool in, on its own, right? So comparing length and partials, just doing half reps in that stretch position to doing full range of motion reps. And generally, length and partials outperform full range of motion for hypertrophy. So I wouldn't advocate for a length and superset where you just do the partials at the end, over lengthened partials, given all of our evidence pretty much is on lengthened partials themselves as a standalone range of motion for the whole set. Finally, time under tension is wildly misunderstood. You shouldn't be training to maximize time under tension. Something like hack squats. So what did we learn here today? When possible, train every muscle at length except the long head of your biceps. That leads to inefficient myosin actin coupling. Also, change your definition. No. The, the long head of the bicep stuff is off. As much damage throughout that muscle as possible. So do a bunch of shitty half reps at the end of every set. As always, programs are linked below all three cool. days. Cool. So that was me reacting to Ryan Humiston's takes on range of motion and understanding of lower muscle length training. This video was decent. He certainly got a few things wrong, but he did refer to the science, right? Like he cited a few papers, did his best to explain them. Didn't do the best job ever, but did an okay job at it. It's better than not setting papers at all, all right? What I'll say also is that his understanding of EMG, actin myosin, etc., it leaves something to be desired. I think on the whole, he gets like a, a seven out of 10, honestly. He understood studies reasonably well, and at least he cited them, which is more than a lot of influencers on YouTube, I'm gonna be honest, all right? But he did misunderstand a few pretty important points. And he also had this odd thing with sweaty and fat people, so a bit weird. Anyways, that was the video. If you liked the video, please comment, like, subscribe, and I'll see you guys, my favorite subscribers, in that next one. Peace.